Good afternoon and, and welcome. My name is Barry Rabe. I'm a member of the Ford School of Faculty and I'm the director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. We are very pleased at Close Up to be able to partner in sponsoring this event with uh, the Domestic Policy Corps of the Ford School. Uh, two of its leaders, Aaron Sullivan and C.J. Labasi, are here, and we're delighted to have them. And do want to point out that the format that we'll be using after the presentation, be thinking even now about questions that you might want to raise for uh, the, the, the latter Q&A conversation. What we'll do is you have opportunities to fill out questions on cards. Uh, toward the end of the presentation, we'll begin collecting those. Uh, Aaron and CJ will be reviewing those and uh, going back and forth, uh, raising questions of our, of our speakers. So please begin to give thought to that now and engage in the conversation that will follow. Um, that said, let me turn to the topic for today. When Rebecca Blank was the dean of this school, before she went on to become the Commerce Secretary and now the Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she often said you could define how excited a person was about introducing someone by the words that they used. In short, it's common to say things like, I am pleased to introduce, I am delighted to introduce. But as Becky put it, and many of you know her, uh, when you begin to pile up adjectives before those words, you really get the sense that an, uh, someone doing the introduction is excited. Let me begin by saying I am very, very, very <laughs> pleased <laughs> to introduce Ken Warner, and actually welcome him back to the Ford School, where if I understand it correctly, and how timely that Paul Courant would walk in just as I'm beginning, uh, that he began his academic odyssey at this university. It was then the Institute for Public Policy Studies. Uh, I'm so pleased to be able to have this conversation for several reasons. One is that this is such an intriguing topic a question of public policy that has evolved in ways that we might not have anticipated 15, 20, or 25 years ago, given the political economy of tobacco. I say that as the son of a retired cigar salesman. I sort of know a little bit about tobacco politics. And the amazing changes that have taken place with some significant demonstrable results, some of which we will probably be talking about in a few moments. And so as a school of public policy, as we think about those areas where it is possible to kind of move the needle in a positive direction through policy engagement, tobacco really does become an intriguing one, and yet with much, much more work to be done. In turn, my great pleasure stems from the fact that we have the chance to welcome Ken Warner and hear his reflections on this issue. It is no secret that Ken is a defining figure in the economics of disease prevention and the application of the tools of economics to the issue of tobacco control throughout the course of his career. I don't even know where to begin in outlining some of the highlights, the awards, the honors, and the superlatives that can be stated. But certainly as this school approaches its centennial next year, and we increase, increasingly in Wild Hall raise the question of how does one constructively apply and engage the social sciences, the policy sciences, to some of the most pressing issues of our time, and do so in a way with real rigor and integrity and have impact, Ken really is the gold standard. He is a model for all of us for thinking about that kind of application and long-term career and long-term impact. Finally, on a personal note, Ken was one of the two first faculty I met when I came to this campus. The other, John Romani, is seated, seated in the third row. I want to just say a word about it. I can certainly speak to both of them, but I want to introduce uh, Ken at this point. Uh, Ken has been just an absolute remarkable mentor for me. Uh, an advisor, someone whose thoughts I've sought on many occasions. The advice has always been on target and an incredible, incredible uh, act to, to try to at least begin to emulate. Uh, someone who has just been a, a great, great friend and advisor in every possible way. And so given that, to go back to the Becky Blank uh, construction, let me just say I am very, very delighted to welcome Ken Warner to give our remarks today on this fascinating title and this fascinating topic. Ken, welcome. Thank you, Barry. That was very, very, very kind of you. <laughs> and I was going to say, I've, I've done a lot at this university. I've been here for over 40 years. And I think one of the most important things I ever did was hire Barry. As I recall, I was department chair at the time, I think, when you got here. And uh, he was uh, certainly 
the, uh, the best uh, hire one could ever hope to make. And in turn, he mentioned John Romani, who was my first department chair. So, and I see lots of uh, friends in here from the old days. Uh, we're going to engage in sort of a journey of nostalgia for those of you who have a little gray in your hair like I do. I guess a lot of gray in my case. A little nostalgia, go back a little ways, and then move forward into the future. So we're going to cover a lot of territory during this talk. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, every, uh, where is Paul Caranta? Oh, there you are. Hi. I, Paul will remember bumming cigarettes from me when we were both new faculty here. I probably bummed some from him occasionally. And uh, I was just commenting to, to uh, Bonnie that it, it's, it's really hard for our students today to realize that when we started out here, I was in the School of Public Health, also public policy, but started out in the School of Public Health, and probably half the faculty in the School of Public Health were cigarette smokers, and we were smoking in our offices. So we have come a long way. Things have changed. And I'm going to talk about a number of things here. Uh, I don't need to read this to you, but we're going to end up looking into the future. Not to say we'll be able to predict the future, but think about that future. So I want to start out with some of the, the dramatic changes that everybody's aware of that have occurred with attitudes and norms concerning smoking over the last, actually it's 50 years, on January 11th. That will be the 50th anniversary of the very first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, uh, which the New York Library, Public Library declared was one of the 10 most important books in the realm of science uh, in the last century. So this is for the nostalgia part. Um, I actually like showing these slides in front of my students, but I've stopped doing it because they have no idea who any of these people are. <laughs> but some of you will know who they are. So we start out with Humphrey Bogart on uh, your left. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, as you know, if you're old enough to know who he is or was, was the most uh, prominent actor of his day. He was considered the sexiest male alive. He was smoking in virtually every scene in every movie that he ever made. Unfortunately, he died of lung cancer in his 50s. Who's the next one over? Well, uh, yeah, Lauren Bacall. I go beyond one beyond. I'm, <laughs> I'm skipping pictures here. John Wayne, the Duke, who made lots and lots of movies, he bragged, by the way, that he beat the big C when he had a cancerous lung removed. Unfortunately, he succumbed to cancer shortly after that. How about the third picture? Who, oh, somebody just said it over here. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, the Bambino, the Sultan of Swat. Uh, interestingly, Babe Ruth never smoked cigarettes, but he was an inveterate cigar and pipe smoker. And what nobody knows about him is this very large man, and he was a very big man, weighed about 90 pounds when he died and was missing half of his face from oral cancer. But he wouldn't let anybody take a picture of him because of that. How about next to him? Good, Edward R. Murrow, who was the most respected man of uh, his generation. He's the guy who essentially put an end to the communist uh, baiting issues uh, that uh, Eugene McCarthy was, not, not Eugene, Joe McCarthy. That, by the way, is a great political science story. So this, this talk is gonna go a little bit longer than I thought. <laughs> I had a buddy in college. He predicted Eugene McCarthy's total vote in the primary, the Democratic primary back in, what was that, 68? He predicted it closer than any of the national polls. He was much closer than any of the national polls. And he found out something that nobody else knew. Why did Eugene McCarthy do so well in the New Hampshire vote? A lot of people thought they were voting for Joe. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, on the other end, I'm not sure if this is Betty Grable or Greta Garbo, somebody like that, but it's one of those sort of symbols of, again, the, the sex appeal of somebody associated with smoke. And in particular, it was the period of women's liberation, when women were now allowed to smoke, starting probably in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and you start to see that. Um, I've got three more images I wanted to show you as well, because they put some things into perspective. Um, so who's that? Yeah, former President Ronald Reagan. I have to give him credit. He was one of the few men of his generation who never smoked. He just advertised. Um, and point of fact, for his generation, the peak smoking rate was something on the order of about 80% of men were smokers. 
Uh, he was not one of them, but he was an advertiser. And here, you could name all of them probably if you're a real good baseball fan. Uh, this is just a typical ad. There, I've got dozens of these things of baseball players and other athletes advertising cigarettes. So it, we've got Bob Elliott, Ted Williams, Stan Musial, Joe DiMaggio, et cetera. And I don't know how many of them really smoked, but uh, they did a lot of advertising. And of course, you can understand the appeal of that as a model. And here's the quintessential image of cigarette smoking, of course. <laughs> Anybody know who that is? Um, I think the last time that I looked at uh, the night before Christmas, he was smoking a pipe. But somehow here, he's transformed into a cigarette smoker. So that was then, and this is now. And obviously, the imagery is just dramatically different than it used to be. And that reflects how we think about smoking in our society. So the change in smoking behavior. Smoking prevalence is much more than halved. Since the mid-1960s, total cigarette consumption in the U.S. was 633 billion. In 1981, when it peaked, it's under 300 billion now. Um, this is one of my favorite graphs. I actually developed this for the 25th anniversary, Certain General's Report, and here we are coming up to the 50th anniversary. It's adult per capita cigarette consumption over the course of the 20th century into the 21st. And it's why, if you look at it, it tells you why Alan Brandt at Harvard named his book about this The Cigarette Century. I think when 21st century historians look back on this, they're going to say it's the most interesting and certainly the most important public health story in the developed world, not necessarily in the developing countries, but in the developed world. I'm not going to go over the various events, tobacco control events that occurred, but lots of them are associated with pretty significant blips. Now, you will note we have here the first Surgeon General's report. That comes the year after the peak level of adult per capita cigarette consumption, which was, I think, what was it, Don? 4,300 or 4,400 cigarettes per adult. And it's just, it's an odd measure in some ways, but it takes total cigarettes, divides them by the population over the age of 17. That doesn't really show you what's happened. I asked Don, because Don Sexton has uh, been working with me, one of our doctoral students has been working with me and some other colleagues at some other universities on a paper that'll be coming out in American Journal of Public Health, where we basically took the smoking experience up through 1963 and essentially said, what would have happened if nobody had ever started talking about the dangers of smoking? And basically, this is where we would have been, and that's a level almost 6,000 that is now five times higher than where we, where we are today. Keep in mind, this measure combines two measures. It's number of cigarettes per smoker per day, along with smoking prevalence. That's why that gap is so huge. But it's, it's an incredible story. So how did this all come into being? Well, basically, there are, I characterize it as five decades of tobacco control. Uh, we started out with an era of persuasion and information. Believe it or not, the first public health people thought that if you simply inform people about the dangers of smoking, they all would quit. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. So in the mid-1960s, that was the thought, that was the philosophy. Inform people, they'll rational, they will stop. Phase two is what I call the first incarnation of the non-smokers rights movement. I'll be more specific about that in a moment. Phase three is an era when everybody was promoting the notion of comprehensive tobacco control, trying to go at it from all angles together. And then phase four uh, is the second incarnation of the non-smokers rights movement. So I'm about to commit an academic heresy. I'm going to commit sociology. Uh, <laughs> I'm an economist, I'm not a sociologist, so please forgive me for this. And if there are sociologists in here who find this of sufficient interest and want to work on it with me, I'd love to do this right. I'm going to talk to you about how I view what has happened. This is sort of my characterization of it. The information and education campaign early on was understood and acted upon by a socioeconomic educational elite. They're the ones who quit smoking. We have very good data on that. I'll show you some a little bit later. Uh, they're the ones who first quit smoking. And of course, they're the politically engaged people. So they lobbied for policy changes, partly because they were interested in public health, and that was a nice thing to do for public health, uh, partly because it was awful easy to do, and it was a little selfish in a way. It's easy to say you want to see increases in cigarette taxes when you're not going to be paying them. 
And in fact, it turns out the people who are going to be paying them now are poor people in large part. How about the ban on smoking airlines? That was the first workplace where smoking was ever banned. Why? What do you think? Why was it on airlines first? That's where they traveled. Pardon? That's where they traveled. Who traveled? The elite. Well, the elite, and specifically, there's a group of uh, frequent flyers who are more important. Actually, these days, they're, well, they're important. They're just <laughs> Congress, right? Congress was the, the biggest group of frequent flyers in the country. They flew all the time, and they didn't smoke, most of them, just like everybody else in their education class. So get it out of the airplanes, because it would be blown in their faces. So it was a very natural first place to see a smoke-free workplace. So the middle and lower socioeconomic and educational groups responded to the social pressures and the environmental changes around them. And that, in turn, the norms changes that occurred led to more and stronger policy change. And you have this virtuous cycle that's been going on ever since this, uh, the early days of this. Health consequence. Uh, this, is, this is also the results here from a paper we're working on right now, going to submit later this month, probably. Uh, since 1964, it's actually just a little bit less than 10 million premature deaths have been either averted completely or postponed as a result of people's decisions not to continue smoking or not to start smoking because of what is going on in tobacco control. On average, on average, each of those people has gained 20 years of life expectancy. Think about that. That's a gigantic change. If you could get rid of smoking, by the way, all smoking, it's the same as if you could get rid of all cancer in terms of what it would do to life expectancy in, in the United States. I think this is, without a question of a doubt, the greatest public health success story in the US and certainly in other developed nations in the last half century. But it's also the greatest remaining problem we have when you look at it sheerly from the point of view of mortality. Now, why do I say that? There are probably people in this audience today who think that obesity and physical inactivity are the major behavioral killers of our time. They don't even come close to smoking at this stage. You can take the highest estimates, and the estimates for the behavioral, as well for the uh, obesity and physical activity, range from about 100,000 deaths a year up to 350, 360,000 deaths. And I don't think much of anybody believes the upper end at this stage. For smoking, the figure that's going to come out in the New Surgeon General's report is going to be about 485,000. So it's possible that we'll see the two of them cross at some point as smoking continues down. And if obesity goes up, it looks like it's leveling off, fortunately. But this is, this is the big problem if you're simply talking about what causes death. All right, what can you do about it? Well, there are three basic categories of policy interventions. This is sort of Coles to Newcastle for people at, uh, in public policy. You know this. For anything, you can take information and education strategies. You can provide economic incentives. Or you can have laws and regulations. We have a huge body of research in tobacco control that allows us to say we have a real, genuine, evidence-based policy field here. Uh, this shows you the categories of what works, what doesn't work, and what we're not so certain about. I'm going to talk about several of them individually. So I'm going to start out with the early years of the anti-smoking campaign, the information in public education. It's hard for people to imagine today, but in that first Surgeon General's report came out in 1964, it was one of the biggest media stories of the year. It came out, remember, in the beginning of the year, on January 11th. It was held, the conference was held on Saturday. It was in a secured State Department conference room. Why on Saturday? Because they were afraid of the effects on the stock market when the report came out. The reporters were given copies of the uh, report to take a look at. They were locked inside the room, literally locked inside the room for 45 minutes before the Q&A with the Surgeon General and the committee that had established uh, that smoking was a cause of cancer. 15% decline in cigarette sales in the very first three months following issuance of the report. By the end of the year, as people lapsed back to smoking, it had dropped to about 5%. But never again would we be as high as we were the year before, 1963. The fairness doctrine ads, how many people here remember, probably don't even know by name, anybody remember fairness doctrine ads? OK, a couple of you. Uh, fairness Doctrine Ad was a fascinating story. So the Federal Communications established um, a rule called the Fairness Doctrine 
that said if you were a broadcaster, radio or TV, and you were broadcasting about something controversial, that you had to donate airtime to the other side of the controversy because we didn't have all the media we did today. There were about three or four networks and there was a monopoly basically. So they, they had to agree to donate airtime. It was designed to cover political issues. But a 25 year old brand new law school graduate went to the FCC and said smoking is controversial. The cigarette advertising on television and radio is pervasive and nobody gets to hear the other side. And the FCC agreed with him and ended up requiring the broadcasters to donate airtime. It was never nearly as much as the pro-smoking ads. It wasn't in prime time like the pro-smoking ads, but for the first time in history, we saw that per capita consumption drop four consecutive years. First time since smoking, cigarette smoking started at the beginning of the 20th century. The other thing that was going on then was cigarette tax increases at the state level, lots of them. Now who knows whether this was people in state legislatures saying that smoking is awful, we ought to do something good for public health, or whether they're saying that's now acceptable, we can raise our taxes and get some revenue brought in. It did both. The tax will raise revenue and will also get some people to quit smoking. So it's a chance to do good while you're doing well at the same time. That spate of tax increases stopped in 1971. Doesn't mean there were none, but it slowed up dramatically when all of a sudden the states got aware of interstate smuggling that was going on because of these large gaps in state tax rates. Started up again around 1981 and went up and it's cycled kind of up and down over the years. What difference does it make? So this is the area that's probably best documented of all the areas of tobacco control, tobacco policy. The price elasticity of demand is about minus 0.3 to 0.5. That means a 10% price increase decreases cigarette demand by 3 to 5%. Roughly half of it is prevalence. The other half is cigarettes per day, which actually is much less important from a health point of view. Low income smokers are much more price responsive than high income smokers. So this means that we have the opportunity to address significant health disparities simply by raising a tax. It fascinates me as someone in public health where the major theme in public health for the last decade is health disparities. Black, white, rich, poor, you name it. And nobody ever talks about the fact that the single most important cause of the difference in death rates between the poor and the rich in the United States is smoking. And we've, the study I said we're just completing now, we're estimating it accounts for probably something on the order of 30 to 40% of those health disparities. Now, you could say that's all true, but what about the regressivity of the tax? And it is a very regressive tax. And we, if we have time later, we can come back and talk about that, something I'm very concerned about. Very importantly, children are two to three times more price responsive than adults. Uh, this is the single most important thing you can do if you want to reduce youth smoking. Unglamorous, but the single most effective thing you can do. So the first incarnation of non-smokers rights law these are 1973 to 2000. It's non-smoking areas and sections. And a lot of you will remember those. Um, I remember uh, waiting in a restaurant in Toronto after they had adopted their first one and we were told we were gonna have a long wait if we waited for the non-smoking section. And we said, we'll wait. I think it was about 15 minutes or something by the time we actually got inside and we were seated there. Every single table had a sign up on the wall, you know, the no smoking symbol. Every single table had an ashtray, and our table is the only one where nobody was smoking. <laughs> so this all starts out Arizona in 73. Minnesota comes up with the first uh, considered model law. Michigan joined the group in 1986. The second incarnation is a fascinating one. This is completely smoke-free workplaces, including all restaurants and bars. Started out in several municipalities, primarily in California. Davis was the first in 1993. And by the way, since this is a close-up seminar, I should point out that the federal government has done some significant things in tobacco control, but this is predominantly a state and local policy story. It is predominantly what the states and localities have chosen to do. And it's frankly where the locus of action is for the advocates, Recent, really because of a divide and conquer strategy. It's easy for the tobacco lobby to, to control Congress and they've controlled it really forever. 
Uh, it's somewhat easy to control 50 state legislatures. Uh, I don't know what it is now, but I remember years ago, four of the top five lobbying firms in Lansing had tobacco as one of their clients. Uh, I don't know what it is today. Uh, it's harder when it gets down to the local level, and that's where a lot of the grassroots action has taken place. But it's also occurred at a national level. As you can see here, Ireland went smoke-free in 2004. March of 2004. Jim and Ann Duderstadt were over in Ireland the next month. And I don't know how, I must have gotten four or five emails from them while I was over there. They love to go pub hopping, and he's just raving about the, you know, the clean air in the pubs. Nobody's smoking inside. You had to go through a haze to get into the pub, but that's another story. So today, more than 30 countries smoke-free includes the UK, France, Italy. You know, you think about French restaurants. You know, what were the, the char defining characteristics of French restaurants? Great food, really good wine, dogs, and smoke. You know, that's a French restaurant. And today you got the first three and the other one is gone. Smoke-free air laws are well studied. We know that uh, workers' exposure to the toxins in smoke is reduced by about 80 to 95%. Obviously, they're exposed, some of them at home and so on. It increases quitting rates in, in compared to uh, workplaces that allow smoking, decreases daily consumption, reduces employer costs. Uh, not only, you've probably seen it when you go into a hotel, which frequently, by the way, is just their choice to be smoke-free, and they'll say $250 cleaning fee if you smoke in the room, something like that. They save huge amounts of money not allowing people to smoke in those rooms. Anybody who's in a restaurant or a bar that used to have cash registers, presumably computerized equipment now, it gets gunked up just as people's lungs do when there's a lot of smoke in the air, and they had to be replaced more frequently. The most important outcome, however, is the most recent. We have over 100 studies worldwide. Uh, if you have a non-smoking workplace compared to one that allows working, you will see a significant decrease in acute myocardial infarctions and deaths from, from myocardial infarctions. We don't know the exact number. It's probably on the order of 10 to 15 percent. I would ask you this question. Do you know of anything in the world of medicine or public health that could begin to have that kind of health impact simply because a governor or some other official signs his or her name to a piece of legislation saying, thou shalt not smoke at the workplace? I can't. Nobody's ever been able to suggest one to me. Advertising and counter-advertising, there's less good evidence on the effects of advertising. The consensus view is that it does cause some smoking. The best single study based on international comparisons suggests if you get rid of all forms of advertising and promotion compared to no ban whatsoever, you reduce smoking by about 6%. You know, your first reaction might be 6%, that's not much. But then you say 6% of almost 500,000 deaths in the United States or 6 million deaths worldwide, smoking's the leading cause of death worldwide, uh, those are big numbers. So this is a real consequence. Counter-advertising, I mentioned the uh, campaign during the late 60s to 1970 with the Fairness Doctrine. Um, some of you probably are aware of the uh, ad campaign that was mounted by uh, Truth through the American Legacy Foundation. They're coming back. I just learned this when I was in Washington last week. And no, Washington was not closed. Um, but it should have, might, probably should have been. But um, the Truth Campaign, which is the second most effective thing after taxes for reducing youth smoking, is going to come back in its full glory, which I'm very pleased to hear about. So what doesn't work so well? School health education, now, fortunately, this is a public policy audience, I won't get in any trouble here. When I, when I say this in front of my colleagues in health behavior, they start throwing rotten tomatoes at me. And so they don't like that because school health education is kind of motherhood and apple pie. And it probably should be at some level, but doesn't work. Uh, why do I say that? It's not that there aren't well-designed programs, that if they're implemented according to the way they're designed, they would have some impact, but think about the, the, you know, what, what, what do school boards care about? What do teachers care about? You know, they got to worry about the three R's and a few other things. This is not a high priority for them. They're not given the resources or training to do it. They don't do booster programs. It just doesn't work. It's kind of like the old D.A.R.E. program. I don't know if the new D.A.R.E. program is working, but the old D.A.R.E. program, there were, what, 30-some-odd studies of it 
and the only one that showed any statistically significant impact concluded that the people, the kids who had gone through the D.A.R.E. program were more likely to start smoking marijuana earlier than the kids who hadn't gone through it. And as my wife will remember, our, our uh, younger son came home from it, and I said, second grade or something like that, fifth grade, I don't know. He said, it makes me mad. It makes me want to use drugs. And he was right. <laughs> Sales to minors laws don't work unless they're incredibly well enforced. Nobody wants to put the resources into it. Pup laws don't work. That's possession, use, and purchase by minors. Most minors and their parents aren't even aware that there's a law against doing that. What may or may not work? Well, we know the current warning labels don't. If you hover around a pack of cigarettes, try to find it. It's on the side. It's usually in sort of a gold script on, uh, on a white background so that you can't read it. And if you did, you're, they're old. So we have these new warning labels that were tied up in the courts and the FDA, which I'll come to later, is probably going to reintroduce them. Uh, there'll be 50% of the front and back of the pack, which, by the way, is no longer even the international standard. It's probably the standard, but there are many countries that are ahead of this now, and I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, the other thing about the US ones that I don't like at all is their drawings. Most countries have photographs. They're much more graphic and I think much more effective. We'll see what happens when that comes back and whether it will matter. Uh, the evidence suggests it does encourage some people to quit, so we're hopeful that that will happen. So what's happened in, in total here? We've had a dramatic impact, but it has taken decades, and the problem isn't solved. So think about this. We got about a fifth of all adults who continue to smoke today. On surveys, 70% tell us they want to quit. Half make a sincere effort every year. A, a quit attempt is defined as quitting for, for 24 hours with the intent of quitting permanently. 50% of smokers try to do that, and here's the unfortunate punchline. We end up with about 2.5% uh, succeeding. Ultimately, it takes about 10 quit attempts for the average person today, 10 serious quit attempts to quit. Why do we have this problem? Well, the people who are smoking today are not the same as uh, Paul Courant and myself and the others who were smoking in the 70s or, or the 80s or even the 90s. Some of them, it looks, are very heavily addicted. Some of them may be what's called hardcore. These are smokers who either can't quit or won't quit, choose not to. They're low socioeconomic status. Think about this. College graduates today, the smoking rate is 7.5%. For people who have only 9 to 11 years of high school, the smoking rate is 36% more than a four-fold difference. If you go back to 1966, which is unfortunately the first year we have data, it's after the Surgeon General's report, there was about a 10 percentage point gap, 40, somewhere in the 40s for the lower education and somewhere in the mid-30s, 34, 35% for people who are college graduates. So we've had enormous success in this campaign, but it's highly concentrated among the kinds of people who are sitting here today. And now I'm going to show you what I think is the single most important fact about smoking today. And most people in giving talks about tobacco control or planning policy mention it and then go on about their business and forget about it. And I'm as guilty as the rest. It is probably the case that close to half of all current smokers in the United States have a diagnosable mental illness or comorbid substance abuse problem within the last 30 days. They are dosing themselves. They're treating themselves. Schizophrenics smoke at an incredibly high rate, something like 60% in the general population and those who are institutionalized where they can smoke, it's more like 80%. Uh, they are giving themselves something they need to take care of, to keep, keep, keep themselves in some sense of stasis. And then, of course, there's this one. Some people simply don't want to quit smoking. The other side of the coin from 70% of people telling us they want to quit is it 30% saying they don't want to quit? And what's the politically correct answer when a surveyor asks you if you want to quit? It's, oh, sure, I want to quit. So it's probably at least a third of smokers really aren't the least bit interested in smoking. We don't ever talk about that in tobacco control. We just assume they want to. Not right. So I'm going to tell you just a, a bit about a model that I've been working on with uh, David Mendez, my colleague, since the early 1990s. And, and the reason for doing this is to say, Please believe what you see on the next three slides. 
This is to show you why you ought to believe this, okay? And I have to say, in fairness, I'm not really bragging here because David is both the brains and the brawn behind this. I, uh, he just let me put my name on it with him, which is very nice. So we have this dynamic smoking simulation model that basically tracks the smoking population. It looks at the percentage of 18-year-olds who come in who are smokers. It looks at people who leave because they die or quit. And it looks at the denominator for each age group as the population at that age. And it figures out smoking prevalence. Okay? When we calibrated the model with data through 1995 only and projected ahead, we hit the NHIS estimate in 2005 to the tenth of a percentage point. We got it exactly. We missed the 15-year projection for 2010 by six-tenths of a point. When we recalibrated to data through 2000, we were two-tenths of a point too low on the other side. The fact is this model works. It's not a brilliant model. It's just logic, and it's, it works. So this is what it tells us, and this is a very concerning story. It says to us, if nothing changes, so smoking initiation remains roughly where it is today. This is actually a little bit higher than it is today. And smoking cessation rates don't change, and it appears they haven't changed for three to four decades, the actual rate of quitting. This is what we're going to be looking at through the middle of the century, 2050. And it's telling us by 2050, we'll get down to 14%. That's scary. And that is plainly and simply unacceptable. Suppose we could reduce initiation by 25% and increase cessation by 25%. That's where we go. Year 2050, we're down to about 10% smokers. In other words, we will have halved where we are now and by 2050, another long period of time. It's a little frightening. If we could reduce initiation by half and increase the cessation rate by half, we end up here. That gets us down to about 7% by mid-century, and obviously we're still falling at a relatively steep slope there. But the point is, the federal goal of 12% by 2020, the only reason the federal goal is 12% in 2020 is because that's what they set it for in 2010, and when they missed it by a mile, they said, we can't raise it for 2020. They're going to miss it for 2020. You know, not going to hit it then. Actually, I, what I suggest to them is they keep their goal at 12% every decade, and we'll get there. You know, eventually they will be right. Eventually they will be right. Now take a look at this and think about the implications of this, because this is a scary story. And by the way, when I said the status quo here, which is the top line, that doesn't mean we don't do more tobacco control. It just means we continue doing what we've been doing at the same rate and get the same results. So it's not like you're stopping anything. You're just not doing anything exceptional. All right, where are we going to go from here? Well, I think I'm pretty confident more states will go smoke-free. Uh, within about five years, I expect uh, most states, not all, but most of them to have a smoke-free workplace law. There will be cigarette excise taxes in, increased in the states. We can be sure of that. Uh, maybe the federal government, but probably not soon, because we had a pretty big increase in 2009, and they haven't shown a lot of uh, tendency to increase the federal tax frequently. More media campaigns. I have to tell you I, this. I was so excited to be invited to speak here. I started working on this talk probably two months ago. It also shows you I have nothing else to do. Um, that's true that I put this together initially two months ago. I have revised a little bit. I put this question mark on here about more media campaigns. Turns out, I learned in Washington last week, there are going to be lots more media campaigns. And they're expensive, so that's kind of cool that's going to happen. Truth Campaign, which was over $100 million a year when it started out, which is the size of a pretty decent-sized advertising campaign, not Coke or Chevrolet, but a pretty good advertising campaign, uh, they're going to go back up to $100 million from about 35 or 40. So that's good. The CDC has been running a program called TIPS, TIPS from people who have quit or, or whatever. Uh, that is going to come back. That's about a $40 million effort. And I understand that the HHS at a different level is also going to put some number of tens of millions of dollars in this. So we're going to see some more media campaigns, and that's a very good thing. What happens if we stick to what we know, the evidence-based interventions? Well, 
You can only go so far, so far with smoke-free. Once it's done, it's done. You can't get extra out of having smoke-free workplaces. Once the warning labels are phased in, they may have a positive impact, but people will get used to them and that will wear off. There's no question about that. There are serious equity issues about how high you can raise cigarette prices and cigarette taxes, given that most of the people smoking are in very low income groups. And that even though they're more price responsive than high income smokers, any reasonable tax increase is gonna get only a small minority of them to quit. So they're gonna get stuck paying for that. Media campaigns are expensive, they're difficult to make them effective. We'll see where it goes. So here's a prediction, <laughs> hope nobody will hold me to it. Um, we're gonna be seeing in 2020 smoking prevalence optimistically 14 and a half, maybe as high as 17%. It depends partly on what you think it is today because the federal surveys are not very consistent. Uh, one of them, NHIS is 18%. Uh, national Survey on Drug Use and Health is 20% or 21%, but it's in that range. And here's kind of the punchline that I think is most upsetting. When you think about this, we're looking at literally hundreds of thousands of deaths per year for decades to come from a cause that is 100% preventable. That just seems completely ludicrous and unacceptable to me. That's what it is. So here's what we're gonna see at the state, local, and institutional level. We're definitely gonna see more novel outdoor smoking restrictions. There are about 6,000 uh, public beaches and parks where smoking is not permitted. That number will go up. Um, University of Michigan was not the first campus to go smoke-free by any means. It was one of the first major universities to go smoke-free, and we're now seeing lots of others follow. Uh, there, I forget what state, but there's another state that just adopted the law that says you cannot smoke in a car if there is a kid in it who's under the age of 18. So these are the kinds of things that for sure we will see more of over time. And then we're going to continue to see all these novel products. And if you're not interested in tobacco per se, you're probably not very familiar with some of them. Snooze, if there's time during the Q&A, we can talk about snooze, the most interesting natural experiment uh, in health behavior probably ever anywhere. Uh, the dissolvables, brand new products called orbs, sticks and strips, you stick them in your mouth and they dissolve, you don't have to spit. Um, E-cigarettes, everybody heard of electronic cigarettes and e-cigarettes, that's kind of a hot issue these days. Uh, they're all around. So this is sort of bred a discussion about tobacco harm reduction, whether it's good or bad. And the, the idea here is there are a lot of people who just aren't quitting cigarettes. Maybe what they need is something else that gives them nicotine, something else perhaps that gives them some tobacco, but is less hazardous. And anything that is not combusted is dramatically less hazardous. There are some forms of smokeless tobacco in Sudan and India that are very dangerous and kill literally millions of people. But if you look at the products that are available in the United States, particularly low nitrosamine, which most of them are, it's not clear that they're very hazardous at all. I can't say this kind of publicly, but uh, there's certainly, you know, maybe 1% of the danger associated with smoking. Should they be out there as substitutes? How should we deal with that in a regulatory sense? Uh, what about e-cigarettes? If e-cigarettes were used by inveterate cigarette smokers to switch, they'd be a good thing. If they're used by cigarette smokers to tide themselves over during the work day because they can puff on these things inside their workplace, but they get people to keep smoking cigarettes outside the workplace, then they're a bad thing. So it's hard to figure out exactly where to take it. I mentioned here the true pulmonary nicotine inhaler. Now you're probably, if you know anything about this field, you're probably saying, we've got a pulmonary inhaler. You can get it by prescription. You get a prescription from your doc, you go and they give you an inhaler. It's not a pulmonary inhaler. When you suck on it, the particles with the nicotine go into your mouth, they're stuck on the linings of your mouth, the oral mucosa, and the linings of the throat, they don't get down into the lung. Most e-cigarettes are probably delivering very little nicotine to the lung. It turns out it is really hard to get nicotine into the lung. There is one optimized form of delivery for nicotine into the lung, and that's cigarettes. Okay? So, Philip Morris International, not the Philip Morris we know and love here, but Philip Morris International, separate company now, bought the patent from a nicotine scientist to a true pulmonary inhaler, 
a very hard thing to do, but he's created a device where you can inhale this stuff without it burning like it would if you were trying to do it otherwise. Uh, and they have promised that in 2015 they're going to bring out a new, new device that sounds very much like it's going to be his pulmonary inhaler. It'll be highly addictive. But if it gives you the feeling like the electronic cigarette that you're smoking, it gives you sort of the physical aspects. People think it's so awful, some people, about electronic cigarettes. You know, my response is, we, why, you know, we, the, the major approach we have taken to dealing pharmaceutically with smoking is to give people the drug and take away the behavior. Why not give them the behavior and largely take away the drug? You know, give them something they can hold between their fingers. Anybody here who's a smoker remembers how important that was to them being able to hold it and the feel and the whole thing. Electronic cigarettes, you can blow smoke out of your mouth like fire, you know, breathing dragon or something. Um, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens with that one. So now we have something altogether new. This is the potential for federal regulation. 2009 uh, Cigarette Smoking Act and Tobacco Control Act, whatever it was called, uh, which President Obama signed, gave FDA the authority to regulate cigarettes and smokeless tobacco products, and they may use their deeming authority to declare all other tobacco products and e-cigarettes under their jurisdiction as well. We're waiting to see about that. Uh, what can they do? They may ban menthol. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. That's an extremely controversial issue politically. Anybody know why? Who smokes mentholated cigarettes in very large numbers? African Americans. About 70% of African Americans who smoke use mentholated cigarettes. For whites, it's a very small percentage. So this is kind of race related. It's very difficult politically, but it's an issue they've got to deal with. The graphic warning labels, plain packaging. What you're looking at here is a mock-up of uh, Australia's new cigarette packs, and they're actually out now. Uh, plain packaging means that, that first of all, they did all kinds of studies. They brought people in for focus groups, and they said, let's figure out what the ugliest, single ugliest, most unappealing color is. And it turns out it's this dark olive green that you see on here. And if you see here, it says brand and whatever else. The size and type of font are identical for all brands of cigarettes. The only way you distinguish them is if you can read. Okay, you can't use a logo or anything like that. And in their case, I think it's 75% of the front and a smaller percentage on the back are warning labels. Uh, that's out. That's happening now. Uruguay has 85% of the front and back with graphic warning labels. Um, FDA could conceivably, uh, conceivably require something like that. They could restrict the marketing of new products or approve others. Uh, the how they handle e-cigarettes is going to be really interesting and these novel smokeless products. They can establish performance standards. Somebody put out a cigarette called Omni. The company was named Vector Tobacco, by the way. I, I love the name for a tobacco company, but it's Vector Tobacco. Uh, they put out a cigarette called Omni, which reduced the PAHs, catechols, and uh, nitrosamine levels by about 80%. Those are the three things that are believed to be the principal causes of lung cancer in smokers. Okay? So that's a big decrease. Nobody bought the product, but FDA could require it. They could tell everybody, you got to do that. The technology is there, you got to do it. If regulation is in fact pursued aggressively, I think the potential is probably quite terrific because they could do things quickly. It can change marketing rules quickly product constituents quickly, product availability. Uh, there's nothing that has more potential to really impact smoking than FDA regulation. A group like this one has got to appreciate the barriers to this. The industry obviously opposes any form of regulation. Uh, the Congress opposes it, see above, because the industry opposes it. And lots of money involved. Uh, legal issues, doesn't matter what FDA does, it will be sued. This happened with the warning labels. And they go to court and they are confronting deep pockets legally. The legal, the money that Philip Morris alone spends on uh, its legal affairs every year dwarfs what FDA spends on all of the issues that it deals with. Obvious black market concerns or are legitimate philosophical issues about how far one should go. And there's simple fact that this is a very low priority of society and government today. By the way, the Obama administration, bless their souls for other purposes, is one of the real barriers here. 
The Obama administration is telling FDA to go slow. They don't want noise coming out of FDA on cigarettes. Opportunities. The public health community is getting very impatient and is going to be applying political pressure. Now, you know, political pressure from the public health community and $1.70 will get you a cup of Starbucks. But somebody at least is paying some attention to this. Uh, we have a new director of uh, FDA Center for Tobacco Products, Mitch Zeller, who is a longtime tobacco control advocate. He worked for Dr. Kessler when he was the commissioner of FDA, and Mitch was responsible for Kessler's tobacco activities. He's heavily invested in this, and he really cares about it. I have to say, with regard to barriers, uh, in Washington last week, I saw a slide that was put together, apparently by the FDA, that shows hurdles that they've got to jump over so that something can become a policy, go through their whole process. There are about 16 to 20 of them. It was one of the most intimidating looking figures I've ever seen. That's not gonna stop them necessarily, but it is very intimidating. So this has led to this idea of a discussion of an end game and the idea of trying to figure out how you can do something more. People are concerned and frustrated with the slowness of progress. Uh, we understand now that business as usual is not a solution, it's continued improvement. Uh, if we don't do something more, we have this problem of this ongoing slaughter of people that's completely avoidable. So people are saying, let's find something different, something out of the box, looking toward the future. So where are the ideas, what are the ideas and where are they coming from? They're coming from all over the world. Uh, from Canada and Australia, we have proposals for not-for-profit regulated supply, take it out of the industry, um, and have a harm reduction mandate. So it's not a matter simply of selling more cigarettes because that's your agency's job. Your agency is to sell fewer cigarettes and figure out how to reduce harm. We have this idea of a sinking lid in New Zealand, and the idea there is a very simple one. Whatever the supply of cigarettes is today, reduce it by 10% each year for 10 years until you don't allow the sale of cigarettes. Easier for New Zealand to do as an island for the rest of us, but a very interesting thing to watch, and the New Zealand government has committed to a tobacco-free society, maybe it's smoke-free, I don't remember which, I think by the year 2025, it may be 2030, but they're one of the few national level governments that's actually done that. An idea from Singapore is to prohibit possession of tobacco for people born after a given year. They usually mention 2000. So this is a smoke-free generation concept. Uh, that's a slow process of moving toward prohibition, basically. Okay? The idea that people have latched onto in the US is this one, reducing nicotine to non-addicting levels. Um, and if there's time afterward, I can tell you a story about how this really is catching on. There are a lot of people, including a lot of feds um, when they're at work who are paying attention to this notion. Um, and the interesting thing is that the law that established FDA's authority to regulate cigarettes and tobacco, other than smokeless tobacco products, says specifically, you cannot require the removal of all nicotine from cigarettes without an act of Congress. However, you can require a reduction in the level of nicotine to whatever you want so long as it's not removed. Think about decaffeinated coffee. It still has a little caffeine in it. Think about no alcohol beer. Almost all no alcohol beer has a little bit of alcohol in it. So the experts in the field think we could easily require a reduction of nicotine levels to levels that could not possibly sustain addiction. And to say this is the idea that most people in this country are kicking around right now. And there's even discussion of prohibition or as Robert Proctor calls it in his uh, book, Abolition. Uh, the book is called, uh, what's it, Golden Holocaust, I forget the subtitle, but he's making the case for abolition and it's a, he's a historian at uh, Stanford, it's a really powerful book, I, I recommend it to you. One of the ideas some of the rest of us are kicking around we call prohibition light, and that's the idea of banning only combusted tobacco products, at least as a first major step toward trying to be tobacco free. But give people tobacco products if they want as long as they're not burning. Burning generates six to 7,000 chemical compounds, 70 to 80 of which are known human carcinogens. Uh, those are not present in large part in the smokeless products. So these end game ideas could dramatically reduce the toll of smoking. The barriers to doing anything like this are obviously enormous and the likelihood of 
seeing something happen in the near term is very low. But I point out to you, we've got New Zealand that's made its own commitment. We have the state of Tasmania and Australia, which is seriously entertaining the notion of the smoke-free generation, the smoke-free 2000 generation. Uruguay is way ahead of most of the world in aggressive tobacco control policy. They're being sued by Philip Morris and others for their policies, and bless his soul, the I guess he's still the mayor of New York, Bloomberg, is funding their lawsuit since their country can't afford it. And then we have Australia, which has been taking a lot of dramatic steps as well. And here's, of course, the critical point. Don't ever underestimate what's going to happen in tobacco control. So I've been in this field for a long time. If you had told me 10 years ago, 2003, that I'd be standing here in 2013, 10 years later, and that there would be 30 countries that had prohibited smoking in all restaurants, bars, and workplaces. It would have started out with Ireland and its pubs, and it would include France and Italy and England and Scotland. I would have said you were out of your mind. I would not have thought that possible. And yet we're here. So what's going to happen? Again, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> near term, we're, I hope we will see more aggressive use of evidence-based interventions. We're certainly going to see more expansion of smoke-free laws to outdoor areas. We are seeing marketing of these tobacco harm reduction products, for better or worse, uh, and some tentative regulatory steps by FDA. It is important to watch what they do with menthol and the warning labels. So here's a problem that we haven't dealt with, and we're, we started talking about this in Washington, interestingly, last week. First time I've ever heard us really discuss it. What's ultimate success? Does it mean reducing prevalence? If it means reducing prevalence of what? We're talking about cigarettes, combusted tobacco products, all tobacco products. When do we declare victory and go home? When we hit 10%, 5%, zero? We're not going to hit zero. We might hit 5%. And 10% is going to leave us with this legacy of hundreds of thousands of deaths a year. Maybe we want to eliminate nicotine addiction. Why would you want to do that? You know, do we care about nicotine addiction per se? Nobody cares about caffeine addiction. They have the same effect on blood pressure and pulse, virtually identical. They set off uh, receptors the same way that uh, caffeine does and uh, nicotine does. It may be more dangerous, but we don't really know. Caffeine, per se, we have no evidence it's dangerous, and it may even be good for you. I say that as a decaffeinated person. It may be hard to believe watching me dance around here. But you should have seen me when I was on caffeine. <laughs> Maybe we should just get realistic and talk about minimizing harm from tobacco use and not trying to be so global and, and uh, you know, excited about big goals. And then, of course, is the question when. We will get down to 10% smoking prevalence in the United States. There's no question in my mind about that. That will happen. But will it happen 10 years from now or 35 years from now or 50? That we don't know. So what's it going to take to make some substantial progress? We've had all the elements you see here, and we've been pretty successful with tobacco control. What we're really lacking right now, and the resources have kind of tailed off. We had more money than we do these days, but, but we still have some. We have more than any other country in the world. We don't have any public interest, which is clearly a problem. And we don't have much by way of upcoming leadership. One of the interesting features of tobacco control is a lot of people kind of got into it at the time that I did, and the leadership of tobacco control looks like me, old white men. Okay? We need to have younger people. We need to have more diversity in the field. We need to have more women for sure. Uh, and we're seeing that internationally. Uh, we're still looking for it domestically. We need more good leadership. And I've got this sort of blank face because Maybe that leadership will come from here. It's tough to get students of this generation interested in this subject, because like most Americans, they think it's been solved. They don't see it as a problem, because not in their face. It's other people who are dealing with the problem. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll ask myself a question. Is that working? I don't think so. We can also talk loudly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start with you. Um, 
start with this mic. No. Do you want this thing? First, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. And we had quite a few questions that were addressing differences in smoking rates based on a variety of factors, but a few focused on smoking and gender differences. And the questions were, if you could comment on gender differences in smoking rates, how they have changed over time, and whether this has any practical implication in terms of policy effectiveness, whether some policies work specifically on some genders or not. Yeah, actually, it's a great question. And we uh, have observed it's a very interesting difference in stories. Right now, female smoking rates are probably 15, 16%, male smoking rates 21 to. So they're close, but they're not identical. And there's been a gap like that for, for many years now. But if you go back to the time of the Surgeon General's report, right before it, what you observed was the male smoking rate was coming down already because of what had been going on about smoking in the 1950s. And it was about Prevalence was a little over 50, probably 52, 53 percent of men smoking then. Women smoking was in the 30s because they started up about three or four decades after men. And if you look at the curves of smoking rates for men and women, it's fascinating. They absolutely parallel each other with a three to four decade lag. The women smoking was still on the upswing. Men had kind of peaked. Women smoking was on the upswing when the, the Surgeon General's report comes out and it kind of puts a halt to it. So you see men go down fairly quickly early on and women sort of level out. So since then, probably for the last 20, 30 years, they've kind of gone down in tandem. Um, of course, there was very heavy marketing toward women. The Virginia Slims campaign, you've come a long way, baby, uh, which started in 1967, I think. Um, was targeting women. There have, been, there have been campaigns that have targeted lots of groups. Women were heavily targeted for a good decade or more at that time. Um, speaking of which, by the way, the single group of people in the world who make the tobacco companies drool more than any other are Chinese females because there's so many of them and they don't smoke. So they're, they're trying really hard to get Asian women to smoke. They were succeeding with Japanese, but they've not been as successful as they hoped. And so far, they haven't made inroads with Chinese women. Uh, I don't know that there are policy differences. There probably are some policy differences. The, li the literature is not very good on that. I've seen some studies with price that say that men respond and women don't. I've seen others say women respond and men don't. And I don't believe either of them. I mean, rats respond to price. So uh, it's, it's, it, women, women and men both have to respond to price. But I don't know if uh, research would indicate big differences. Thank you. We have another question uh, that's more focused towards socioeconomic status. Um, this person asked that if socioeconomic status is such an important factor, um, and especially in that last 20% of being sort of a different class of smoker uh, than the rest, the, this person asked, does that suggest that it might be better to move upstream and, and work on factors that affect socioeconomic status, such as income or education disparities, uh, to then sort of indirectly affect uh, smoking habits? Uh, there, there's a real answer, easy answer to that, sure. <laughs> I mean, if I could wave my magic wand and come up with a, a, a desired policy, it would be some policy that would get the poor out of poverty and the uneducated educated. And we could not, you know, we wouldn't have a whole lot that we had to worry about if we could do that. We'd find things to tinker on in the fringes, but uh, sure, that would be the ideal policy. Absolutely. If somebody knows how to do that, uh, I would love to hear it. Yeah. We seem to be moving in the opposite direction. Another question that came from the audience was about um, how smoking policies are interacting with um, mar marijuana policies. Uh, and this question is, Uruguay just legalized marijuana. How do you reconcile this with harsher controls on tobacco? And are they just trading tobacco for something else? Well, that's, of course, fascinating to watch. We now have a couple of states which have legalized marijuana, not just for medicinal purposes, but in general. Um, I don't think it's, I, I know it's not a trade in the, in the sense that nicotine is, you know, is, is a far more addictive substance. And it has the advantage, by the way, this is some, the tobacco companies used to say when we were first talking about addiction, they used to say smoking's not addictive. People aren't, you know, rolled up in little balls giggling and 
you know, stuffing food in their face or doing something silly because, you know, they're high from it. They just go about their daily living. And my answer is that's why smoking is so very addictive because you could go about your daily living doing that. It is harder to be stoned and functioning well in, uh, in some jobs. I mean, <laughs> we, we had a painter once who, he was a real artist and he was always very stoned. Um, but the, I don't think they're substitutes for each other. And of course, the really critical thing to think about here is there are two extremes. There's completely unregulated legality, which is in large part what smoking has been. And then there's complete illegality, which is what we've had with marijuana and heroin and cocaine and so on. Uh, the public health response is to try and come up with policy measures that make it a little difficult to use this stuff. But if somebody gets into trouble with it, give them a way out, you know, other than prison. You know, give them education, give them uh, cessation programs, give them some kind of residential program if they're addicted to drugs or whatever. Uh, so I don't think they're the same by any means, although I think it's fascinating to watch the opposite directions in which they are moving right now. But I mean, marijuana, uh, most everybody I think who knows much of anything about it, I think would argue that it's ridiculous that we make it as illegal as we do and that we send people to prison for it. Now, what a waste of uh, human resources and other resources to stick people in prison for, for drugs. Uh, another question we had was about the role of state public health departments and what role they play in smoking reductions. Well, as I said earlier, the, most of what has gone on in tobacco control is a state and local phenomenon. So you have a few things at the federal level, like the Federal Communications Commission, the Fairness Doctrine, uh, occasional federal tax increases, there are not many of them. Uh, but most of it, if you look at smoke-free laws, uh, you look at state-based media campaigns, you look at tax increases, they come from the state and local level. Uh, you know the old story about if something starts out in California, that you know, it sort of diffuses to other states. There, there are, what, four? Jack Walker, who used to be the director of public policy studies here, used to look at uh, the politics of diffusion of political innovation among the states. And uh, there are certain states that in their regions are sort of the, the leaders that will get you to figure out where, you know, where things are going. Uh, and California, of course, is the leader. And uh, look at what happened with smoke-free environments, smoke-free workplaces. It started out in Davis. In 1993, there were a huge number of California cities that were smoke-free before any state was. So it's basically, this is a state and local activity. It's unfortunate in some ways that the feds can't take more uh, steps, stronger steps. Uh, they have the potential now with the FDA regulation. We'll see if that amounts to anything. Right. So another question that we had focused on uh, the kind of generational gap in interest you were talking about. So the New Truth campaign makes use of Twitter. And do you think that the use of social media will have a significant impact on smoking cessation in the generation that heavily uses social media? And what other policies do you think can galvanize interest among a younger group? Well, social media is obviously where it's at for younger groups. And I think there's no question that it has to be used. Uh, Truth has been doing that for a long time now. I don't know what the new campaign is going to be a hundred million dollars. I don't know how much of it's going on to TV ads and how much it's going to be placed elsewhere, but you've got to use social media for certainly for younger people. One of the problems with younger people, this is very interesting, is a lot of people, a lot of students at University of Michigan uh, smoke on the weekends or they'll smoke when they're with some friends having a beer or something. They don't think they're smokers. If you ask, you know, you ask people if they smoke, no, no, I'm not a smoker. Or if you ask them a smoker, I'm not a smoker. And then you ask them about specific occasions, oh yeah, I'll do it then. Um, we have a situation now that we never used to think was possible. We've got about 20% of all smokers nationwide who don't smoke on a daily basis. We used to think if you were a smoker, you had to smoke about a half pack a day at least, or you wouldn't be able to sustain your habit. Now we have people who are doing it on a non-daily basis. And actually, Paul will know whom I'm talking about here. We had a guy in our poker game uh, who, well, he ran the one of, I think it was the first non-smoking vegetarian restaurant in Ann Arbor because he saw an opportunity, a financial opportunity. He was a smoker. His wife wouldn't let him smoke at home. He couldn't smoke at work because he'd said there was no smoking in his workplace. And he'd come to our poker games and in the dead of winter, since we didn't allow smoking around the table, and he was the only smoker, he'd go outside and stand in the snow and smoke a cigarette. He'd buy one pack for while he was at the poker game. 
Now, anybody here who's ever played poker, you will appreciate, you don't want to get up to go to the bathroom. You don't want to miss one hand. And this guy was standing out in the cold to smoke. And that was the first time I ever really started thinking about it. There are different ways in which you can be addicted. And it turns out there's loads of literature on this that addiction is very much socially conditioned, socially defined. We've now defined it as unacceptable in the workplace. Uh, it's something that people, you know, in Ann Arbor, you don't see many people smoke at all, and, but there are other places where you do. It just depends on sort of the social background. But uh, the non-daily smoking phenomenon has us perplexed. Uh, we had a couple questions about the nature of tobacco products and the way they've changed over the years. One is specifically how nicotine ha levels have changed in cigarettes, and then the other is how the development of sort of the electronic cigarettes, snooze, things like that, has affected the control of, uh, of smoking. Okay, well, the first thing to say, and this is something that uh, people don't appreciate, is the, the modern cigarette is one of the most heavily engineered products in the world incredibly sophisticated engineering of them. So have they increased the addictiveness level of them? Yes. Is it always through increasing nicotine? No. Some of it is through increasing uh, ammonia as an additive, which actually uh, heightens the effect of the nicotine. Uh, there's all kinds of other substances that may contribute that we don't know whether or not they contribute to addiction. And the uh, product is uh, uh, great as well. Here's a fat cigarette. Okay, uh, no, but nobody appreciated this when they first came out. But when we came out with light cigarettes, remember in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, they came out with the new light cigarettes, much lower tar and nicotine delivery. Well, it turns out the way they were made, this is actually a very simple technology. The vast majority of them, if this is the filter end of it, had a series of microscopic perforations around the filter, okay? And the cigarette smoking machine that the FDA used to assess nicotine and, uh, and tar yield, which was published on the packs by requirement then, held the filter tip like this at the very end of the, the cigarette. It pulled on it a fixed number of times with a fixed intensity, okay? And that's how they measured. They took a look at what was in the filter and what was coming out of the filter end to see what they were getting. And that's how they measured tar and nicotine. Well, it turns out that smokers would hold the cigarette like this. What are they doing when they do that? They're occluding half of the holes. The holes were there so that when the machine smokes it, it pulls air in and dilutes the smoke. When you're going like this, you're blocking half of the holes. If you happen to have large lips, you're what we call in the trade a congenital hole blocker. <laughs> you block 100% of the holes, and there's no more air flowing in, and you're getting more tar and nicotine. And in addition, you suck on it harder when it's got a tough yield. Anybody who remembers the old Kent filtered cigarettes, the original filtered cigarette, they were tough to get anything out of. So you'd, you'd really suck on them hard. The machine sucks exactly the same on every cigarette that it's measuring. So that was a way to fool the machines. Uh, which they were very good at for any number of years. So they're highly engineered. The other products, the smokeless products that they're producing today are in general very low nitrosamine. Um, and as I said, very frankly, I mean, I would not encourage anybody to start using them, perish the thought. Uh, but if somebody's using them, I'm, I'm gonna go into it. If everybody's using those, I'm going to a different field. I don't care. I'm not real worried about them. So I will take advantage of this time to mention snus. How many of you even know the word snus? Okay, just a handful of you. Snus is a low nitrosamine smokeless product that has been used by Swedish males for about four decades now. Uh, it, it turns out that originally its nitrosamine level is considerably higher than the new products in the US, but it was still relative to other smokeless, it was low nitrosamine. Because largely, they didn't tax snus very heavily, and they did tax uh, cigarettes very heavily, so it's $14, $15 a pack or something. Swedish males started using snus in large numbers. So approximately 30% of Swedish males have been snus users for four decades now. Turns out, Sweden has the lowest male smoking rate of any country in Europe, and I think probably of any country in the world, and they have the lowest lung cancer rate of any country in the world. So I shouldn't say that, in Europe. We know that, we know it's Europe, 50 some odd countries in Europe. And this has been just a natural experiment, basically set off by price. Interestingly, women have not adopted snus in large numbers. 
But so it's 30% of men uh, use snus and maybe 14 or 15% of them smoke. Some of them use both. Uh, the interesting thing is that the Swedish health ministry has studied this product, if you'll pardon the expression, to death. Uh, they've done I don't know how many studies. Two of them have suggested a risk. One of them suggested it could increase the risk of diabetes, which makes sense because it has sugars in it. I mean, the smokeless products have lots of sugars in them. The other one suggested an increased risk of heart disease, but there have been two or three other studies that have not found that. No study has ever found any association of the use of snus with any form of cancer, none. So frankly, as I say, these low nitrosamine products, now, they're not nearly as addictive as smoking. They're not as much fun. It's gonna be real hard to sell them. And so far, these strips and orbs and sticks, nobody's buying them. E-cigarettes, they're buying. They got some cachet and some people are putting money into them. You've seen the ads, the complaint that a lot of the activists in tobacco control have is they're using exactly the same advertising themes that the cigarette companies used you know, 20, 30 years ago. Sexy models, you know, this is cool, let's do this, this is a neat thing, this is a modern thing to do. Same theme, same models, but again, we don't know to what effect at this point. Did I talk long enough that I managed to avoid answering the question? <laughs> <laughs> they can't even remember the question. Like, okay. Uh, an additional question we had is about the expansion of bands beyond like specific spaces to outdoor bands and how effective they've been in also struggles with enforcement when you're taking it outside of confined spaces. Yeah, it's probably harder when you're doing it outdoors and when you're doing it indoors. One of the remarkable things about the indoor bands is enforcement has been almost non-existent and unnecessary because compliance is pretty high. People can see when you're smoking and you get such dirty looks, people tend to comply. Uh, there have been a few countries that have had problems early on when they've introduced these laws, but almost all of them, as far as I know, have been completely successful with them. Outdoors, a little bit more difficult. Uh, I don't know, what's your observation around U of M? You know, it's the policy that's not particularly well advertised to people who are not here on campus, but my sense is that smoking has reduced significantly on campus uh, from what I've observed, but, uh, but I'm not a particularly good uh, official judge of that. But people are going to do it, and it's going to be hard to enforce it, and the question is whether you want to spend a lot of resources on enforcing it. I don't know. I, I probably wouldn't. Uh, another person asked if you would comment on the effect of litigation on reducing smoking. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a real important area. Litigation has done lots of things, and it's, uh, it's in the news every single day. I mean, every single day I get at least one email on new lawsuits and, or old lawsuits and what they're doing with regard to smoking. The single most important one was uh, the MSA, the Master Settlement Agreement. Have, how many of you have heard of the MSA? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, this was a, the settlement of the lawsuits by the states against uh, the tobacco companies by a very original legal theory. It started out in Mississippi. There were four states that did their cases individually and were successful before all of them got together to work as a group. And the legal theory was you cigarette companies are imposing costs on us, the state, because we've got to pay for Medicaid victims of lung cancer and heart disease and so on. And the burden goes on the innocent victim, the taxpayer. So it removed the, the, the base of most of the lawsuits, which is somebody decided to smoke. You know, the company's always saying they could have quit. They just chose to smoke. It was their decision. It wasn't the taxpayer's decision that Medicaid smokers should get lung cancer and they have to pay for it. So these lawsuits were very successful and we ended up with the MSA, which depending on which side of the issue you happen to be on was good or bad. It sent many billions of dollars to the states. Uh, it did not do much for tobacco control. Uh, I happened to be on the very first board of directors of the American Legacy Foundation, which is one of the spin-offs of uh, the lawsuit. It was created by the lawsuit. It's the one that put together the truth campaign. Our first chair of the board was uh, Chris Gregoire, who some of you will know is the immediate past governor of the state of Washington. At the time, she was the AG for Washington and uh, was the one who led the negotiations for the attorneys general. So I came up to her, I'll never forget this, the very first meeting, and I said, you know, Chris, why is there nothing in here that says you've got to devote 5%, 10% 
of your state resources to public health or tobacco control. The money just went to the states. And she looked me straight in the face, this is a great politician, looked me straight in the face and said, oh, we just assumed that everybody would do that because it was the right thing to do. <laughs> the other thing they did that was a real misfortune in that uh, particular, the, the money's great for the states. You know, we had those ridiculous uh, scholarships in the state of Michigan that subsidized the rich. Uh, the kids who went to school, their parents got a subsidy, and it, it was just a stupid way to use the money, but, but that's what we chose to do with it. But the one that really got me was the 99.05 clause that was in the MSA. The 99.05 clause says uh, the various participating manufacturers, all the big tobacco companies, will pay to the states at whatever the rate was, it was hundreds of uh, millions of dollars a year, billions of dollars, excuse me, a year, I think it was $8 billion a year or something like that, for 25 years. And they would pay, I think it was 300 million a year, roughly, based on sales, to the American Legacy Foundation, which was mounting this truth campaign, which ended up working. But the truth campaign and the Legacy Foundation was only gonna get their money for five years unless Thereafter, the participating manufacturers constituted at least 99.05% of the market, the cigarette market. So I said, what is this nonsense? This is ridiculous. And she said, oh, our actuaries and our accountants, everybody looked at this real closely. They said there's no possibility it'll ever be less than 9905. And I said, that's ridiculous. It's got to be less than 99.05 already, you know, right now in the, the beginning of this thing. And of course, I think it was 97 at that time, and it's probably down to about 95% now or something. So that was an opportunity that was really missed in the MSA. The other lawsuits are ongoing. I, I saw an email today, a uh, discussion about the Florida case, which was the uh, class action lawsuit. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. But the question is whether the benefits or whether the, the rights of suing pass along to the uh, children of people who are deceased because they were members of the lawsuit. So there's just lots of discussion about these things. A lot of the lawsuits have been settled, but not for nearly the money that was originally awarded for it because the companies can drag these cases out forever and do. But I, th but I think the lawsuits have been important. They're increasingly important around the world right now particularly, unfortunately, because the tobacco industry is suing the countries that are trying to adopt tobacco control policies. We could obviously continue this conversation for some time, given the nature of issues and certainly Ken's expertise. I do want, though, to invite you to continue the conversation out in the Great Hall where we have refreshments. We didn't think to order snooze and alternative products of that sort. <laughs> but appropriate refreshments for a fall afternoon. Before we do that, please join me in uh, th thanking Ken for a very illuminating talk. Thank you. Thank you.